Uh, first up, uh, uh, first timer at our colloquium, uh, Paul Anderson, one of our own, and he will give us a presentation on similarities between Minoan and Semitic material culture. All right, let's get Greek. The ruins at Knossos were discovered by Minos Calcaranos in 1878. It was at that time that he performed initial <coughs> excavations at Kefala Hill, uh, exposing part of the storage magazines and a section of the west facade. Though Schliemann had expressed interest in excavating, it was not until 1900 that Sir Arthur Evans purchased the site and was able to begin extensive excavations. There, he found the culture he dubbed Minoan, naming, naming it after the legendary King Minos, uh, adoptive father of the Minotaur. This culture remains a fascinating one, not only because the material culture is so compelling, uh, but also for the deep mystery of its language. After a hundred years of excavation and study, our understanding still has many gaps. Linear A is undeciphered, and though we have many tablets bearing, uh, bearing inscriptions, they are unreadable. While they were literate, the Minoans have left no literature that we are aware of. Who were they? Where did they come from? What were their beliefs, passions, fears? These questions cannot be answered with their own testimony. Thus, we are left to glean whatever we can from the artifacts they left behind. Now, <clears throat> this is a very difficult process that presents many challenges to our efforts. Uh, sites like Knossos, at their height, were bustling centers of trade. Uh, they had people from all manners of culture dwelling in them, traveling to and fro. With the people went goods, exposing the residents to a myriad of different styles. <clears throat> this intermingling with other cultures led to ideas being smeared from people to people. Because of this, we cannot operate under the assumption that we are examining something isolated from its context. Similarities between remains may be important, but they can easily be an example of the motion of ideas. In many ways, these move in a manner analogous to a living organism. One term coined for these ideas is that of the meme. What significance do memes have? <coughs> you may recognize this fellow, or his brethren. <laughs> this is an example of uh, what meme has become associated with in popular culture, an image that people find amusing, entertaining, that spreads. But the concept is actually much more profound. It's a much deeper idea. It was coined in 1976 by Richard Dawkins to describe how ideas move and evolve within human society. Uh, he's by training an evolutionary biologist, and he sought to apply the principles of his field to the behavior of concepts and ideas in a population. Using the model of a gene which evolves and moves among living organisms, he coined the term meme to express a similar concept. A meme is a unit of idea or belief. This evolves, changes, flows just as genes do. You may have... Uh, it is possible to consider things like language as symbiotic living organisms. They are not themselves biological, nor are they even tangible. They do, however, reproduce and evolve. Material culture is the physical manifestation of means. A pot in the protogeometric style is made in the Aegean and sold in Canaan. A Canaanite potter sees the style and likes it. He then begins to experiment with copying the design and elaborating upon it. 
the mean of the design has just reproduced. Affected by forces of selection for survivability that are not that different from what is encountered by any living organism. These will then survive, adapt, and flow in accord with the tastes of those propagating them. In this case, pussycats. <laughs> the flow and evolution of means is a considerable confounding factor for any efforts at gleaning information about history from artifacts alone. Are those making the pot from the same culture? Has the pot been shipped as an exotic item of trade? Or is it simply another meme that has flowed from one population to another? We are going to look at a few artifacts that may be examples of meme flow, or examples of deeper cultural ties. It is important to keep these possibilities in mind when embarking on an inherently subjective effort such as this. We start in the Neolithic. Uh, on left is a figurine found in Crete, uh, dated to 5400 BC. It's currently in the collection of Heraklion Museum. You'll note uh, it appears to be feminine. Um, the uh, in zigzag incision is decoration. On the right, uh, this is a Semitic figurine found at Sha'ar HaGolan. It has been dated to the 7th millennium. This is the product of a culture known as the Yarmoukian, which left more than 300 such figurines at the site. This example shows evidence of having been painted vermilion. Of particular interest are the incised lines Depicting a woman. If, if you look, you can see the eyes, head, neck. Mm -hmm. uh, these are often carved from pebbles or made from clay. Uh, clay figurines from the site in this vein are almost caricatures, emphasizing the feminine form. Uh, these appear to represent one who is almost obese, a uh, size that would be surprising for the period. The ones carved from pebbles in many cases are little more than inside than angled incisions. It is believed that pebble figurines were used in a religious rite, where they were heated in a fire and applied to the initiate's face to burn marks into the skin, a form of branding. Uh, these are found in the absence of any apparent remains of shrines or other religious buildings. Perhaps the best, best match to be found is in pottery. Uh, on the left is an example of Agios ware, uh, dating to 3000 to 2500 BC. You'll note the linear decorations filling space. Uh, these also help to accentuate the, the shape of the pot following it down. On the right is a pot found at Tel Catan. It's dated uh, a bit earlier. You'll see that the, it shares the same linear decoration that uh, accentuates the spherical shape of the pot. Uh, also, some very distinctive forms of pottery appear at the site. Uh, so stirrup jars have been found at Tel Catan, along with other pots uh, exemplifying this beaked design. I, I wanted to show more, but you run out of time. <laughs> uh, hordes of consecration are a common theme in Minoan art. Seen at Knossos, uh, the horns appear to be echoing the importance of the bull in their worship. Similar horns appear in a more subdued form on a number of altars, this one in particular, found at Beersheba. Pictured as a replica, uh, the original is in a museum. It is quite large, though there are other smaller examples to be found. This one was found in 1973. Uh, it was not preserved in situ. It had been dismantled and the blocks were used in the wall of a storehouse. While we know the height, the width and depth are conjectures. 
Uh, it is not known whether we found all the stones. It stands five and a quarter feet tall, which is just three inches shorter than I am. I've, I've seen pictures of people standing next to it, and it's huge. <laughs> um, one of the stones has an engraved decoration of a twisting snake. Uh, the Bible mentions horned altars a number of times, and in that text, they are considered to be the holiest part of the altar. In a paper by Aubink in 1937, uh, not only is the role of the horns in securing refuge considered, grasping them as a means of gaining asylum, uh, but also that they can be used to represent the god itself. Examples of this appear in a number of different places in Assyria, Babylon, Phoenicia, and others. The ziggurat at Susa had bronze horns. These were broken off by Assurbanipal in 647 BC, ostensibly as a way of stealing the deity. The smaller variety of altar were used for burning incense. As well, we see one of the most iconic elements of Minoan art, the running spiral. They decorated almost everything with running spirals. Uh, the running spiral motif is here exemplified in a basalt bowl uh, from the Holy of Holies at a temple in Hazar. And it is dated roughly contemporary, yeah, roughly contemporary to the, this Larnax, which was found at Agia Triada. Uh, these are my favorites. These are both examples of extraordinary craftsmanship. Tiny spheres of gold are fused to the surface without the use of solder. Uh, perhaps the most remarkable part is the ability to place such fine granules without modern tools. Uh, these both employ repoussé to add a sense of depth. Uh, they're, very, they're quite small. Like the bee pendant is maybe about that tall. And even in this picture, the beads are too small to really resolve. And this was, of course, an earring. You know, this is rather later than the pendant from the Minoan. On the left is one of the Bafeo cups. Uh, on the right is a silver repoussé cup found at Ang Samia. Both demonstrate the application of repoussé. They share similar form and demonstrate an interest in figural art and depictions of narrative. Note that the style of the Semitic example is much less realistic. It shows a rigidity often seen in Egyptian art. A pattern band at the base may have evolved into the band of terrain seen at the base of the Minoan cup. Note the almost insect-like appearance of the figure on the cup from Ain Simea. Uh, it's reminiscent of Daedalic sculpture found in Greece. This, combined with a more lifelike and flowing depiction, <coughs> could be a sign of improving techniques as we move from one to the other. Um, and you'll note that this cup is considerably earlier than the Vafeo cup, or a Vafeo cup. Definite articles are important. Too bad for Romans, then. These similarities even extend to some myths that have survived that may share known origins. Um, a number of these similarities are to be found. In particular, Samson and Hercules. They both share great strength. They both share lion iconography. Uh, Samson in particular having slain a lion with his bare hands and both suffer death due to the actions of a woman they loved. Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. Though reluctant, he leads his son to an altar and prepares to slaughter him. God, satisfied by his demonstration of devotion, halts the proceedings before any blood has been spilled. He then sends an animal to be sacrificed in Isaac's stead. 
Agamemnon is sailing to Troy, and Artemis stops the wind. The only way they could appease the goddess was to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia. At the crucial moment, Artemis spirits her away and replaces her with a deer or a goat. Noah finds himself in a world engulfed in sin, and God decides to destroy it so as to cleanse the earth of its sin. He is commanded to build an ark, which he loads with provisions and animals, and the world is flooded, killing everyone save Noah and his family, who proceed to repopulate the earth with their descendants. Deucalion marries Pyrrha. They live at a time when Zeus decides he wants to wipe out the race of bronze. Deucalion is instructed in the construction of an ark, which he loads with provisions, and embarking the rain begins. The race of bronze is killed off, the earth dries, and they disembark. This is one area where the two diverge significantly. Whereas Noah and his family repopulate the earth, they do so the old-fashioned way. When Deucalion and Pyrrha must repopulate the world, they throw stones over their shoulders. These stones sprout into men and women like seeds. It is worth noting that while we have some strong similarities between Old Testament myth and the Greek myths, <coughs> These similarities nearly vanish as we move to the New Testament. In spite of attempts at equating Jesus with Dionysus, the fit is really very poor. Uh, this would seem to imply a similar source from which both traditions began to diverge. This divergence reaching the culmination seen in the New Testament, where they have become really quite different. So, how does all of it stack up? We can see similar means of production in the making of jewelry, a fondness for the delicacy of granulation with repousse giving forms depth, Neolithic figurines of similar shape with incised lines, horns as an important element of worship, application of running spirals as a space-filling pattern, worship of a goddess connected with snakes, pottery and decoration in the fourth century that is nearly identical. Fourth millennium. I missed that reference. He pointed it out to me, too. <laughs> I didn't fix it. Uh, I hope you find me, I hope you join me in finding these similarities to be most striking. Uh, with luck, these may lead us on the path toward a deeper understanding of this mysterious people. Perhaps it will even aid the cracking of linear A. Thank you. Do you think there's a difference between cultural diffusion and um, memes? Uh, memes, I think, are a prime example of cultural diffusion. Um, memes are the elements which are diffused. So, just as you may have water moving across a semi-permeable membrane uh, expressed as osmosis, <laughs> I'm trying to remember that one. It expresses osmosis. Cultural diffusion is the process by which means move. So, any more questions? Yeah. You lost me when you were talking about myth. I don't know, just wondering what, for your arguments about the um, similarities between the known culture and Semitic cultures. Why is Greek myth relevant, exactly? Well, the hypothesis that I've been considering is that these cultures don't exist in isolation. The, I, I spent quite a bit of time during my research trying to untangle the mess, and you, you can't. Um, so inevitably, Minoan elements, some Minoan elements make it into Mycenaean and then are possibly preserved into later periods. Uh, so the hypothesis that I'm considering is that possibly these myths share such similarities because 
of a similar origin that may pass through the minoans. Okay, so you're not uh, not positing then. Mino well, what am I saying? You're not claiming that these are minoan myths, but that um, there's some other perhaps Near Eastern source. Yeah, I uh, my inclination is to believe that the myths originated in the Near East, mm -hmm. and then were transported with the Minoans along with their material culture. Uh, the, the, the best fits for artifacts seem to happen earlier. And then as, you, as we move later, you, know, you notice as we move through the slides, the timing diverges, and the, the designs diverge and become increasingly different. Uh, so I, th I think if you trace those both back, they, link, they go towards a single point. But I think that, the, that you're seeing them moving from the Near East to the Aegean, not the other way. I, I wonder if flood myths would come from one point, because people have shown that flood myths are pretty universal, even yeah. in North America and so forth. So it might be hard to prove that flood myths come from one point. Uh, they might reflect something deep in our psyches about well, one floods and pasts and I don't know what that And of course one thing you and I were talking about yesterday, which is a number of Greek myths do involve the ancient Near East, like the Europa yeah. story. Yeah. A Phoenician uh, princess is brought to Crete by Zeus. Yeah. Or Cadmus, for instance. Yeah. Well, so you've shown the similarity between two parallel kind of artifacts, but um, have you noticed like the means being manifested in um, different media. For example, you, you show two jewelry, pieces of jewelry that exemplify the B image, but then what if the meme that was initially um, represented in one kind of medium then appears in another? Can you account for that? Like, you might first find it in literature, and then that literature might trigger a reproduction in art. Yeah. And it, it doesn't always have to be that the meme expresses itself in exactly the same medium. Yeah, exactly. Well, the um, memes are to be <laughs> <laughs> um, memes are to be considered uh, separate from their tangible realization. So the memes inform the creation of material culture. So it's like Marshall McLuhan said, the meme is a message. Exactly. <laughs> I just have a couple questions. I just want to make sure you're, so. you're stating that um, culture is moving from the east to the west and not backwards. Or well, there is a certain amount that will be flowing back, okay. but um, that that's an inevitability. Yeah. The but it does appear that the earliest beginnings start in the Near East. Then we have the Minoans. Setting up, and from that point, the two proceed almost in parallel but increasingly diverging. Of course, it's not a linear process, but. Yeah. I have a question about the horns at Knossos. Now, yeah. that's certainly something that we all have in our head the horns. I have a picture of myself sitting in those horns. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing, though? It's not an altar, right? What are those horns doing? And you find them in larger and smaller examples, yeah. and we find them in the peak sanctuaries. So it's not an altar, like you mentioned, but what are they doing? Well, in my research, they seem to be uh, in the most of the time they're in the vicinity of where sacrifice has been performed. Now, of course, in the altar, they're actually a part of the surface on which the sacrifice is being formed, performed. But if we consider the horns as a symbolic representation of the deity, it makes a lot of sense because, in a way, by performing sacrifice proximal to the horns, the deity is witnessing the sacrifice. And, uh, of course, that is apparent in the altar as well. And when someone grasps the horn of the altar for, for refuge, uh, that is a sign of almost, of, similar to grasping the idol of the deity. 
So I think that that is ultimately sort of... Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's why, for instance, Seleucus I, when he took control of Babylon, immediately represented himself with the horns of Marduk yeah. on his helmet, on all his coins and portraits, yes. to appropriate that power, that association. Yeah. Any more questions? Ah, I think we're good to go. Thank you.